Good morning and welcome. It's good to see you all this morning. I have just a couple of announcements before we begin our worship service. So if you have your bulletins, that will help the process or at least make more sense to you. Um, I hope... If you, okay, so I'm getting from the ushers here. If you are sitting on the outside of the pew, if you could slide in and make room for people so they could have a place to sit. All right, so if you're on the outside of the pews, if you want to slide together towards the middle, that'll uh, create a little bit of room for everyone. Thank you. Let's see if I could have the one picture. Hopefully you were able to take advantage of muffins for mom. Um, this was kind of going on before our Sunday school hour. If you didn't get a chance to take advantage of it, I'm guessing that there's some muffins left over. I'm getting the nod, yes. Uh, so you can help kind of clean those up after the service. So thank you, Amanda, for uh, helping put all that together. It looked great. Just a couple things that are going to be ending this next Sunday, the 19th. So one of them is your PVMC t-shirt. The elders are providing these free of charge. You just have to fill it out. Um, get your name on there and the sizes, and we will get you shirts as quick as we can. But they have to be turned in next Sunday, all right? So you've got to get these turned in. Fill out the form, put it in the box by the credenza. Also next Sunday, we will be celebrating communion together, and that's open for everyone that claims Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So we look forward to that. Also, our GLOBE project is going to be coming to an end. Kids, if you received a letter from someone in Montbilliard, France, you are invited to write them back. So parents, and this includes me, I've got a, uh, a letter from a child that we need to write a letter back. So please get that done next week uh, so we can get those sent off. At the close of our service today, the youth have a fundraiser. And so if you ordered a meal, and I'll try to remind you this at the end of the service as well, if you ordered a meal, they have meals ready for you. If you are one of the people that text and did not order a meal but wanted one, Chelsea said there may be some left, but you got to wait to the end to get your meal. So you're kind of, if you were flying, you'd be on standby, all right? So just know that. Um, are there any other announcements that I need to make this morning? Okay, the last, well, I guess I can speak to one thing. Krisha, did you want to have an announcement? Come on down. While Chris is coming on down, uh, last Sunday uh, we had a vote. We were considering the kitchen remodel project as it had been presented by the committee, and Chris is kind of the contact person for that. Uh, 108 ballots were cast, and the motion was approved. Krisha, what are next steps? Yes. So first of all, thank you guys, everybody that voted, um, for your support and your prayers. Um, we would appreciate those prayers as we continue moving forward. So we are now in somebody else's hands at this point. Um, paperwork has been started to submit to the fire marshal's office for approval. That process could take, we've heard some got it back in two weeks. We've heard some got it back in nine months. We don't know. So that's kind of where we're at now. We've started the intake paperwork and we'll get the plans drawn up and submitted and get that approval. So, um, I don't know, are you, okay. Yeah, I'll let you do that. So we would just appreciate your prayers for the process and the timing that everything comes together um, in God's timing and mm. not ours. Um, we don't want to rush this, but we are anxious to keep moving forward. So thank you guys. Well, the rest of that then is next Sunday we will begin submit or you will have a chance to participate in a survey and the survey is just asking the question that we asked when we built this building. So do we want to start when we have 75% of the funds necessary or do we want to start once the project's fully funded? And so you get a chance to kind of weigh in on that and that will help guide the kitchen remodel committee as, as they look at remodeling because once the process starts over there, they say it's about six to eight weeks to completion. So it's something that's gonna be done fairly quickly. Um, so anticipate that. Now, are there any other announcements that I've missed? All right, well, we have activities for the children. They're on clipboards, there's more out in the foyer. Kids, if you didn't get one, we recognize the kids after they've turned in five of these. And so I've got two people that have turned in five. So if Jackson Wangard and Wesley Kimball, if you would come on down. 
Looks like they've completed five. Let's see, Wesley, you're up to 45 of these now. Tremendous. Um, and I think you guys can get prizes from Faith Slagle at the end of the service. Congratulations. <laughs> Carl, will you call us to worship? Well, good morning. This morning is a special day. You know, we've already said Happy Mother's Day, but I'll say it again. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, I, for me, personally, I'm very blessed. I have a wonderful wife. I've had a, su a super mom. But I also have an aunts and sisters and daughters and nieces. And so I, I am truly blessed. And I, I want us to recognize in our church family how blessed we are uh, for all of our godly ladies here. We have such a wonderful heritage here, and I'm so thankful for that. And I want to encourage all of you ladies here, the older ladies, I want to encourage you all to pour into the younger women here. And for the younger women, I encourage you guys to seek out an older lady for wisdom, for guidance, for counsel. Uh, there, you have a rich, a rich heritage here to, to plug into, so please do so. So in honor of the ladies in our congregation, I want to read from Proverbs. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still dark, provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, for he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them, and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. So once again, we want to bless you ladies today. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the rain you're sending outside right now, just the sound of the thunder and the moisture that's falling on the earth, Lord. I pray that you would refresh our souls just as you are refreshing the land right now. Lord, I thank you for the lights that we've been able to see at night in the sky here, just part of your creation, Lord, your beauty for you have created all things. And Father, we don't even know half of what you've created. You created each one of us, and Lord, it's your desire that we would be in a relationship with you, and you made a way for us to walk in righteousness with you through the blood of your Son. Lord, we praise you for that. That's why we're here today, Lord, to worship you and to praise you. We dedicate this service to you, and may everything we do and say be it, bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Kyle, would you come? As we continue to worship this morning, I invite you to stand if you're able as we sing, Come Let Us All Unite to Sing. <clears throat> Sweet news. 
you join with me in prayer? O oh Lord, our, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Yes, Father, you are majestic. You're way more than we can understand and comprehend. But we thank you that you care for each of us. We thank you that you're fully aware of, of the strife that's happening around the world, and especially in, in this country. We, we watch, we don't know how it's going to turn out, but you do. And I just pray that you will continue to be merciful, you will continue to, to draw people to yourself in the midst of, of all the uncertainty. Father, another very speci special blessing you've given us is our mothers, and I just thank you for the mothers among us today, but also for those who've, who've gone to be with you. But the, the impact of our mothers continues to, to live with us. I just thank you that you've, that you've gifted women with the ability to, to be mothers, to have that special touch. Uh, just thank you again for how you've created us. <coughs> Father, thank you for this caring. As we anticipate the kitchen remodel, I just pray that you will continue to work out the details for that and that you will use you will use this activity as a, a means of drawing us together, but also uh, enabling us to, to reach our community in a more effective way. We're involved in a lot of different ministries in the community and around the world, and I, I thank you so much for the opportunities that you have given us but obviously the work is not done. And I just pray that you will continue to open doors for, for us to continue the ministries we're involved in, but also to, to find new opportunities to, to let people know about, about you and, and the transforming power that you have. I just pray that you lead each of us as we go about our daily lives and that you prompt us to, uh, to recognize opportunities and to reach out. Father, I just pray for Pastor Jeff as he brings a message this morning. Pray too for the elders as they give leadership, as they as they pray, as they seek your face, I just pray that you, you lead them in a very clear way. Thank you for being our God. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I invite the children to come forward to put money in the offering bank. 
We'll be reading this morning from Romans 12, 14 to 21. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will reap burning coals upon his head. Do, <clears throat> do, not overcome e do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We didn't actually talk before about wearing the same color shirt today, but oftentimes we do. Not talk about it, we oftentimes are similar. That's pretty random. It is pretty That's random. Pretty. I'm sorry. It's pretty random. <laughs> Father, I thank you for this time, Lord. I pray that you would empower Jeff with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you give him boldness to speak the words that you have laid upon his heart. And Father, I pray for each one of us that you would empower us with your Holy Spirit and give us ears to hear and hearts to receive and a desire to go and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before I forget again, um, Travis Chupp's grandfather passed away this week and a graveside service will be held tomorrow at 2 o'clock over in Pryor, Oklahoma. Um, so remember the family as they uh, kind of journey through this. Um, Travis's mom was an only child, and so it's a, a, a tight-knit group that uh, has lost uh, the patriarch of the family. Well, it is not patriarchs that we speak of today, but matriarchs uh, across the United States. Uh, today is Mother's Day, and you strip away all the commercialism of it and all the sappiness. It's a day in which children get to um, say thank you to their mothers. Um, for those who did not know their mother or had mothers who were less than motherly, uh, today is an opportunity to honor those other women in your life who have come beside you and helped you become who you are today. Uh, these individuals who showed you how to respond to situations in appropriate ways, who were nurturing and, and showed you how to nurture others, who found ways to meet you where you were at even on those worst of days, taught you empathy, that ability to understand the feelings of others and, and to share with them, right, to be where they are, and to be sacrificial, to be willing to voluntarily give yourself and your wants for the wants of someone else. In many ways, those words describe my mom, and I am grateful uh, not only to have a mom that exemplifies all those things, but a mom who loves Jesus. And I not just know that she has shaped me, but I know that she's shaped my children. I know that she's shaped people beyond our biological family. And so as I think about our church family, women in the church hear me clearly, whether you have a biological child or you see all of the kids in our congregation and hear them, be mom to them. That's what my mom did. That's the example she set before me. She's always taught Sunday school, been involved in vacation Bible school, um, countless other things. She might be the first face that someone meets when they come in because she's a greeter on a rotating schedule. Not only that, but she went beyond our church family. And when I was growing up and when the program was in place, she and my father would open their home to international students that had come to study at Heston College. My parents lived in Heston, Kansas. And so they would become mom and dad for at least that first semester and all the holidays and all the other times. 
I'm sometimes uh, convicted a little bit because it's those adopted sons that are often quicker to call my mom than I am. Her impact is profound. So for all of you mothers and for all of you who have given a motherly example, happy Mother's Day, right? You're important to the kingdom, and I'm so thankful for you. John Wesley, the co-founder of Methodism with his brother Charles, once reportedly said, I have learned more about Christianity from my mom than all of the theologians of England, which is a pretty high praise. Um, Susanna Wesley was quoted as saying, there are two things to do about the gospel, and it sounds like she was pretty matter-of-fact and straightforward. You believe it, and you behave it, right? Um, in the scripture read for us today, the Apostle Paul lays out for the church at Rome expectations for how believers are supposed to behave it, right? That's, that's what he's speaking to. He's speaking to the very thing that Susanna Wesley was speaking to. Now, in this passage from Romans, Paul is not introducing people to Jesus, okay? They already know about Jesus. He's writing to a group of believers, much as are gathered here today. And he's instructing these Jesus people on how to live. Now, there were a couple verses that stood out to me, and I hope that you were listening intently, and there's some verses that stuck with you. This is a passage that we have often read and perhaps are quite familiar with, but at a time in our world where there is a lot of strife, whether it is here at home, in the political realm, whether it is in Israel, whether it is around the world, in places where there's significant unrest, where people are dying for their faith, um, these verses really speak to me. The first one is to live in harmony with one another. It's an expectation. And then Paul will go to say, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, so if you can make it happen, do it, he says, live at peace with everyone. The last line that was read for us is a challenging one. It simply says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Today, I want to focus on a story that if you're following our church's reading plan, you will encounter again later this week. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 25, and it's really a story about someone exemplifying these very things that Paul has talked about. So it's not just words on a page, but it is a life lived, right? It is someone behaving it, if you will. The primary characters in this story um, is Nabal. Nabal is a, a wealthy man living in the southern part of Israel. Now, the representations on the screen obviously are not true to form, all right? So give me some grace there. But just so you get a sense, right? So we've got this, this wealthy guy, um, lives in southern Israel. Um, he's in the region that was given to the tribe of Judah. Uh, Nabal's role in this story is that of the villain. He's the bad guy, if you will. He is portrayed as being mean and ungracious. Okay? Opposite him is another man by the name of David. Now, this second character we're somewhat familiar with um, David, at the time of this particular story, is kind of in between, right? So this is the same David that takes the sling and he kills Goliath. This is the same David that will be anointed king over Israel. But at this point in the story, he's not yet, okay? So he is anointed king, but he hasn't taken the throne yet. The current king, King Saul, has it in for David. And so David is no longer in the service of Saul, but he is running from Saul because Saul wants to kill him. Now, the final character in this, this story in chapter 25 um, is a woman, and that's why we're focusing on her today and, and kind of paying homage to women and the gifts that you bring to our church community, to the world. This is the character that I want you to pay attention to. Because of the three, Abigail best exemplifies the kind of person that the Apostle Paul is talking about in Romans 12. Abigail, though not a mother herself yet, demonstrates not only those idealized characteristics of a mother, but the attributes of a godly individual. Okay, So her example is something for all of us to pay attention to, something for all of us to emulate, if you will. 
Because it's Abigail, not David, in this story, who is the hero. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 25. And I will mix a little bit of reading and telling the story kind of as we work through this. Chapter 25 opens with kind of bad news. Um, the gentleman, the prophet, the judge that anointed David king dies. And he'll be buried. His name was Samuel. And so now David is a little bit all alone in his kingship role, right? The one guy who could kind of vouch for him is dead. David then will move and he will run from Saul and he'll run to the desert because no one chases people into the desert. And so here we have David running to this, this desert. And if you can see here, um, it's right beside the Dead Sea, about midway, if you will. Um, this is in the same area that Nabal has sheep and goats, um, has territory. We will hear it and it will be called Carmel, okay? This is not Mount Carmel where Elisha is doing amazing things. This is a different region. It's kind of a desert place, okay? And so David is going to flee to this area um, in hopes of getting away from Saul. And he does. And he does. Now, picking up kind of the, the scripture here, verse 2, a certain man from Maon who had property here at Carmel, right? And so this is in that region within the dot, was very wealthy, right? Not just wealthy, but very wealthy. He had lots and lots of money. He had a 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep, which he was shearing at Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. And the description of Abigail is pretty profound. Uh, the Bible will describe women lots of different ways, but rarely this coupling, okay? The Bible says that she was first intelligent, and then that she was beautiful, Okay? And the Bible's really setting up kind of a comparison between Abigail and her husband Nabal. But her husband, and we get a sense of his ancestry here, a Calebite, was a surly and mean fellow. He was mean in his dealings with people. All right? So you can imagine that person that's just really hard to get along with, that's Nabal. Okay? And you wonder, how could he land a wife like Abigail? Right? We have we experienced that somewhat, right? You know, how did they end up with them? <laughs> Maybe not exactly. But it was a mismatch to be sure. Now, the description Calebite lets us in on that Nabal is from the tribe of Judah. Caleb would have been one of those spies that Moses sent out years and years ago to spy out the promised land, the very land that the Israelites are in now. Caleb was one of the spies who, come back, who comes back and says, hey, I think we can take it. He gives a favorable report. He's one of two, right? Um, Caleb was a godly man. His ancestor Nabal is not, all right? So a little more irony there. But, Caleb, but uh, Nab Nabal is of the same tribe that David is. And so we'll see some of that familiarity here as the story continues to unfold. Well, picking it up again. While David was in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. Now, this is an exciting time. This is the kind of time that we experience here at harvest, right? So when all the combines are out, not so much on a rainy day, but when all the combines are out and the wheat is being cut, everyone is in a generally good mood, tired but generally happy, right? David is counting on the same experience with Nabal and his sheep shearing operation. So David sends 10 young men and he says to them, go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, long life to you, good health to you and your household and good health to all that is yours, right? He's trying to bless Nabal. Now, he goes on to say, I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat, him, mistreat them. And the whole time that they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants and they will tell you. Which means that David and his men that have gathered with him didn't take the odd sheep or goat to eat. Okay, And David's just identifying this. We could have, but we didn't. 
Because of this, David asked simply Nabal to be favorable towards his young men since they've come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. All right? Share a little bit is what he's asking. And it's a good time to ask for this. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name, and then they waited. Okay, so they probably had to give the story a couple times to a couple different servants. Eventually, the story gets to Nabal, and Nabal will come out, and he will give them a response. Now, Nabal's answer to David's servants is a little bit less than. Actually, it's a lot less than. Okay? They come asking for a bit of a handout, um, and Nabal lets them have it. He begins by simply saying, who is this David? Now, obviously, Nabal knows who David is. Because then in the very next breath, he asks the question, so who is this son of Jesse? Right? He knows. He knows who it is. It's of the same tribe. Many servants, Nabal says, are breaking away from their masters these days. And Nabal tips his hand and lets us know that he knows that David is no longer in the service of King Saul. Now, Nabal is probably favorably disposed towards King Saul. Not that King Saul was a great man, but that King Saul helped eliminate the Amalekites that are living just south, right? So these Amalekites would have threatened Nabal's territories. King Saul goes down, destroys almost all of them. Um, and so Nabal rightfully um, is pleased with who King Saul is. So the fact that David would break away from King Saul's service is a sticking point for Nabal. Well, Nabal continues, why should I take my bread and water and the meat that I have slaughtered for my shears, for my own people, mind you, and give it to you guys? Give it to this David and his band. Well, David's men turned around and they went back. When they arrived, they reported every word to David. And David's reaction is rash. It is vindictive, to be sure. And he tells his men, immediately, put on your swords. He's been offended, and he's going to sort this out with a sword. So they put on their swords, and David puts on his. And about 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. So the majority of the people staying with David are going to go with him now to fight Nabal. So the stage is set. Nabal's rebuff of David's request triggers the conflict. David is offended, and bloodshed is promised. Enter Abigail and her motherly example. Now, Abigail wasn't present when David's men came, but one of the servants who was tells her what happened, right? And he relates the message, right? David sent messengers from the desert to give our master greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to, the, to us. And so the servant is confirming everything that David's young men had said. They did not mistreat us, and the whole time that we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us all the time. We were herding our sheep and near them. So not only did they not take from them, but they actually protected them. Now the servant says to Abigail, now think it over and see what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man and no one can talk to him. The servant sees what's on the horizon. He knows how this works out. This is at a time where people were destroyed and entire families and groups were wiped out with this kind of offense. And the servant's scared. The scripture says that Abigail loses no time. She immediately has a plan. She knows what to do. Abigail is responsive. She's not passive. She doesn't sit and wait for things to kind of happen to her, as would have been expected women in her position. But now she's going to do something about it. She understands how dangerous the situation is and immediately takes steps to resolve it. She knows that her husband won't. So, it tells us that she took 200 loaves of bread, no small thing, mind you, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five seahs of roasted grain, and a hundred cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And then she told her servants, go ahead, and I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal, at least not yet. 
Well, Abigail will meet David, and I'll go back here. This is a, an artist's representation of kind of what's going on. You see all of David's men dressed in armament, ready for battle, and here you have Abigail coming. And the scriptures will say that David's men will descend upon her, so they have the high ground, so she is in an extremely vulnerable situation. And she comes running, riding in on her donkey, and she meets them. And it is this moment that Abigail demonstrates this motherly example of self-sacrifice. She has put herself between her husband, who is mean and surly, and David, who is offended. She is living out what was told to later to the church at Rome, as much as it depends on us to make peace with those around you. She is committed to live in peace, mind you. Now, David had just been saying before Abigail rode up, it's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the desert so that nothing of his went missing. He's speaking of Nabal. And he has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. Abigail has presented something different. She's offered herself. Instead of a sword, she's finding another way. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and she bowed down before David, her face to the ground. It is a position of submission. And she falls at his feet and she says, my Lord, let the blame be on me alone. She takes her husband's offense and she claims it. In baseball, we call it a sacrifice fly. In all other parts of our lives, we find it challenging to do, right? To take the blame for something that someone else has done. And yet this is what Abigail does. She says, please let your servant speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. May my Lord pay no attention to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name is fool, and folly goes with him. But as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my master sent. It is in this moment that Abigail is empathetic. She understands what David is going through. She understands the pain that Nabal has caused in showing him offense. After all, she's married to the guy, right? Now, it was probably something that we're not familiar with. It was an arranged marriage. Her parents saw an opportunity for their daughter to be married to a wealthy man, and so they marry her off. The way she talks about Nabal, though, it is a loveless marriage. Now, her faith then is to be bonded to this character forever, not because she wants to be, but because she has to be. And no doubt, Nabal's surly and mean character had not been kept from her. So she's had to deal with this guy day in and day out. She understands what David's going through. She perhaps has had some of the same thoughts that David has had. She continues, though, Now since the Lord has kept you, my master, from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, may your enemies and all who intend to harm you, to harm my master like Nabal, and let this gift which your servant has brought to my master be given to the men who follow you. She's kind of preempting him a bit. She knows what's on his mind, and she is inviting him to think differently about it. In this moment, she is that nurturing mother, right? She's going to supply their physical needs with food, but she's also speaking into his life here. She's trying to develop him into the person that God wants him to be, not that the person that he is right now, a man intent on bloodshed. She will go on a bit further because she doesn't want David to find himself against God. She recognizes that he has God's hand upon him, and doesn't want that to change. She continues saying, Please forgive your servant's offense, for the Lord will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my master, because he fights the Lord's battles. Let no wrongdoing be found in you as long as you live, even though someone is pursuing you to take your life. The life of my master will surely be bound securely in the bundle 
of the living by the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies, the Lord will take and he will seek a vengeance. And it's at this point where she lets him know, I don't want this on your conscience. Okay? She's turning him away. She's trying to nurture him. She's trying to develop him. Unlike Nabal, David sees the wisdom in what Abigail is saying. And he accepted from her hand that which she had brought to him. And he says, go home, go in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house and he was holding a banquet. He's celebrating this, this shearing event, this harvest, if you will. And his spirits are high and he's drunk. She could have told him then what had happened, but she doesn't. She waits until the next morning when he's sober. She's being honest and faithful at this moment in my, in my mind. When she tells him, the scripture says that his heart failed him and he became like stone. Ten days later, Nabal, the surly, mean, nasty guy, is dead. In all of this, Abigail has been faithful. Above all else, while she didn't take time to tell Nabal her plan to resolve the conflict that he had created with David, she does ultimately tell him, and her faithfulness is rewarded. First, because David's anger is pacified, and he allows her to return home in peace and doesn't pursue his plan to destroy all the males in the household. But in an unexpected twist, Abigail is actually freed from an ungodly husband. Now, Abigail will go on to be one of David's wives and a mother. She will have one son. And beyond that, we know nothing of the rest of Abigail's story. Well, we've looked at Abigail's life and her example today and tried to hold it up as a way to faithfully follow God, kind of the embodiment of the believers that Paul spoke about in Romans 12. Now, the truth is, for all of us, we are an example right? Everyone is an example. Now, the question that remains that you are determining even now, is it godly or is it not? Questions you might ask, what kind of example am I? What kind of example are you? Abigail's example is one to follow. How about yours? Are your life choices, are the episodes from your life going to be used later as examples to tell other Christians on how to behave? Or will you be cast as the villain, acting like Nabal? Are you part of the story where it says, don't be like? Now, Nabal and David's and Abigail's story is over. The fact that you're here today should remind you that yours is not. You are not and have not um, been limited to who you've been or the example that you've put forth. Let me say that one more time. You are not limited to who you've been or the example that you have put forth. You are free to chart a new course. Now, this is the good news. This is the good news that Jesus came to deliver. You have been freed from your past so you can have a better future. You can pursue better things. You can be that better person you've always wanted to be. So maybe instead of asking the question, what kind of example are you? We would do well to ask the question, what kind of example will you be? For those who want to be like Abigail, but haven't made Jesus their Lord and Savior, that's the first step. You can't be like Jesus without his spirit dwelling within you. Many try. And they eventually run out of the energy to to keep up the facade. And pretty soon they start doing things just because they have to do them. Not because God's spirit is inside them compelling them to do the things of his will. And at that moment, suddenly you stop looking like Jesus and you start looking like the world around you. The truth is, only when Jesus is the one who drives you, motivates you, who dwells within you, will you find the strength to live like him. So for those who know Jesus and believe, may you, may I, surrender our lives increasingly to Jesus. 
and become that person that God has redeemed us to be so that our lives might serve as examples both to Christians and non-Christians of like about what God desires for us and of us. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you today for the gift of life, for the gift given through mothers. Lord, we praise you for Abigail and her faithfulness and her example. Lord, may we aspire to be like her. May your spirit fill us up to overflowing that your goodness would roll from us. And Lord, for those who do not yet know you, who find themselves in perhaps parched places where despair seeps in, where questions of am I enough are harbored, Lord, may you come near them and know that they are enough because you are enough. Lord, send us now from this place bent on being your examples this week. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Kyle, if you'll come and lead us in our closing song. Congregation, please stand. Again, if you ordered a lunch from the youth, please go and pick that up in the breezeway immediately following our service.